This is lesson 4.1 uh, on properties of quadratic functions. This will be our first lesson on unit 4, analyzing quadratic functions. Uh, this is going to build on what we learned in uh, unit 3, where we learned about solving quadratic equations. Uh, more so in this unit, we're going to focus on the graphs that go along with these uh, quadratics. All right, so let's get started. A quadratic function is any function that can be written in the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c, we say, are all members of the reals, and a cannot equal 0. Why a cannot equal 0? Because that would get rid of the quadratic that we have right there. So basically, any time that we have an x squared here, uh, we're going to have a quadratic. All right. So this is called the general form. So this graph, or this uh, equation right there, is a general form of the quadratic function. Uh, in later lessons, what we're going to explore is something called standard form, okay, and the benefits of that. Uh, let's focus on the graphs here, the characteristics of the graph. The graph of every quadratic function is a curve called a parabola. Okay, this is a word we definitely need to know. Uh, the characteristics of a parabola are listed below. So you'll notice that the one on the left-hand side here is a graph that opens up. Whenever we see a graph that opens up, or is a smiley face, I like to say, we know that it's going to be the graph x squared. Now on the other side, for instance, the graph opens down. And as a result, it makes an unhappy face. And so we put a negative with that. All right, so it would be negative x squared. That's always going to happen. So you can always tell if the graph is happy or sad based on if it's positive or negative. Now some other characteristics. The first one, uh, they've listed the parabola. The parabola is just the graph itself. Uh, down here we see that we have the vertex. The vertex is always your uh, least or greatest point. And so for this one we call it a minimum because it's the uh, smallest point on the graph. All right. and the last thing that I have on here is this axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry basically cuts the graph right in half such that the left-hand side could be reflected onto the right-hand side. On the other side, we have the same thing. Uh, we can label this as the parabola, of course. This would be my vertex up here. Only this time, it's not a minimum. It would have to, of course, be a maximum. All right. And then my axis of symmetry, of course, is cutting it in half. Now, last year, we explored domain and range quite a bit. Uh, we're still going to be talking about domain and range. Just to remind you, domain is what possible x values you could have, and range is what possible y values can you have in a graph like this. Now, this one I've just done in general. I haven't really put like a grid anywhere like that. So as a result, uh, we don't know specifically uh, the, the numbers we're going to be dealing with. But one thing that we can always say about parabolas or quadratics is that the domain is going to be all real numbers doesn't matter what we have, any parabola is going to be all real numbers. I'll explain to you why. You notice how this graph looks like it's going to keep going, right? Like, so we would say it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. That graph is actually going infinitely to the right and to the left on both of these. And so as a result, we would say that the x can be anything. It keeps going and going and going forever. Now, the range is not quite the same thing. If you look, since this one has a minimum right here, then everything must be greater than that point. So I'm going to write it like so that y must be greater than or equal to whatever that point is right there. On the other hand, over here, we would say that the range is going to be everything that's less than that point. y is less than whatever that point happens to be. So if, it, if this was, uh, let's say, 4 on the y-axis, we'd say that everything had to be less than or equal to 4. Uh, on the bottom of this page, what I've included is some definitions. Uh, these definitions we're going to be talking about uh, quite a bit, sir, or these words, I should say. Uh, so I want to make sure that you guys are comfortable with them. The vertex, we said, is just the maximum or minimum point. Um, the axis of symmetry is going to be uh, that line that kind of cuts it in half. And the interesting thing is when you find out what the vertex is, for instance, maybe like x, y like this, your axis of symmetry is always going to be x is equal to whatever number you had here for your vertex. All right. Let me give you an example going back up here. Let's say we found out that this vertex was at uh, 1, 2. Well, then that means that this x coordinate right here is going to be with this axis of symmetry. If you remember, lines going straight down are always x equals. Okay. 
Uh, what else do we do? We have the y-intercept. That's just where the graph crosses the y-axis. Pretty obvious. Same with the x-intercept. And we talked about domain and range. Okay. Head to the next page. So specifically today, what we're going to be concentrating on is uh, looking at a graph or or graphing um, an equation and uh, seeing what characteristics we can pull out from it. So it says graph y equals 2x squared plus 4x minus 6 for the values uh, for these values of x. Um, so they're saying that x is between negative 4 and 2, and determine the intercepts. So they want the x and y intercepts, the coordinates of the vertex, the equation of the axis of symmetry and the domain and range. All right. So what I'm going to do for you here is we're going to start by making a table of values to find out this information. All right. So since they gave you specific values for your uh, your graph here, make sure you use those. They tell you that they want the x values to go from negative 4 all the way to 2. So those are the values that I'm going to use right here. Okay. Now, on your own, what I'm going to expect you to be able to do is you're going to have to substitute negative 4 into this and figure out what you're going to get. All right? I will show you a, a little trick using my graphing calculator right here. Um, is what we can do is if you put in this equation, 2x squared plus 4x minus 6, and if I go second table right here, it generates my table for me. Okay, which is kind of nice. Now, I'm assuming that you guys could do this all on your own. All you would have had to do is take negative 4 and substitute into that graph, and you would have got the same answers. So I'm going to record these ones down, what we have. We had, when we put in a negative 4, it spits you out a 10, a 0, a negative 6, a negative 8, a negative 6, a 0, and a 10. Now, hopefully you can notice something about these, that we have some symmetry right here. All right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph those, and you're going to see that you're going to get a parabola that's going to pop out. Okay, so let's go ahead and graph this carefully. So at negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, we have a point at 10. And at negative 3, we have a point at 0. At negative 2, we have a point at negative 6, like so. And then at negative 1, we have a point at uh, negative 8. And you'll see that all this is just going to be reflected like so. All right. So now what I'll do is just with a different color, I'll, uh, I'll complete the graph here. And so we got this beautiful parabola like so. You should try to draw it as straight as you can. You know, mine's not that good. Uh, I always tell students if you miss a point like this, let's say it doesn't go through it, just make the point bigger. And then you'll be good to go. So that's my graph. Now I need to try and interpret some of the different things that they were looking for. All right. So Let's pull this thing up and see what we can do. It said determine the intercept, so let's start there. Well, we have an x-intercept right here. Okay, So we have x-intercepts. Maybe I'll just draw it like so. And we would say the x-intercepts, well, we have one. This first one that I drew the arrow to is at 1, 0. And the next one that we had is at negative 3, 0. Okay, and so these are my x-intercepts. Uh, let's look at my y-intercept. I have a y-intercept right down here. And so the y-intercept, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, down 6. So it would be at 0, negative 6. All right? So I want you to list what the, uh, the ordered pair value is. Uh, what else do they ask for next? They ask for the coordinates of the vertex. Remember, your vertex is your maximum or minimum point. Of course, in this uh, circumstance, we have a minimum. And so this would be my vertex. And the ordered pair of your vertex is at negative 1, negative 8. All right. uh, what do we got next? We have the equation of the axis of symmetry. Now, in the uh, previous page, I told you that the axis of symmetry is always going to be x equals to whatever the x value was from right here. So it's going to be x equals negative 1. It's going to be your axis of symmetry. And lastly, they want your domain and your range. Now hopefully you remember the domain every single time you have a parabola is going to be x is a member of the reals. But for this graph, notice how they just said that it could only go from negative 4 to 2. That means that this is your domain. x is between 2 and negative 4 like so. Okay. Your range. Well, how high does this graph go? And how low does it go? It goes down here to negative 8, and it goes all the way up to 10. So we would say that the range is between 10 and 
negative 8. All right, good. So, what we're going to see is sometimes what's going to happen is the x-intercepts uh, cannot be identified nicely from a table or graph. So we need to find another way to get them. Uh, how we can do this is we can solve the quadratic equation by setting it equal to zero. And so we had some experience with doing this last unit, so that's why I'm going to kind of race through this pretty quickly. All right, so let's try example two. It says determine the x-intercepts. Now, um, a word or a little phrase I want you to know is sometimes we call uh, determine the x-intercepts finding the zeros of the function. Now, why would we call them zeros? Well, for instance, these would be considered the zeros. Whoops. All right, why these would be called the zeros is because um, the y value is equal to zero. So, for instance, that uh, x-intercept is at negative 3, 0, and that's at 1, 0. Okay, so the y value of them are always going to be equal to zero. All right, so what we're going to do is we'll take this equation, negative 2x squared minus 6x plus 20. And essentially what I'm asking you guys for is, where does this graph cross the x-axis? Now right away, drawing myself a sketch, I know that it's going to be an unhappy face because the leading coefficient's negative. I'm basically looking for what are those two mysterious points. And so what we'll do is we'll take the graph and we'll set it equal to zero. All right, And then from there, we're going to go ahead and try to solve this thing. Now I'm going to notice right away that you can factor out a, uh, a 2 here. Okay, and specifically, I'm going to factor out a negative 2. So if I factor out a negative 2, I have negative 2, brackets, x squared, plus 3x minus 10 is equal to 0. Now I'm going to use my factoring skills to go ahead and see what I have here. So my two brackets, like so, I'm looking for numbers that uh, multiply to give me negative 10 that have a sum of 3. That, of course, is x minus 2 and x plus 5. Hopefully you're getting uh, a little bit more confident with this. Now I'm going to take each one of these brackets and set them equal to 0. x minus 2 will be equal to 0, and x plus 5 will be equal to 0. Okay? So there's two different scenarios, essentially, where this graph is going to equal 0, and that shouldn't surprise us, because that's what we were expecting to find. So we have x is equal to 2 as a possible solution, and x is equal to negative 5 as the other solution. So those are your two zeros of this function. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we're going to explore says, when the coefficients in the equation of a function are fractions or decimals, we're going to have to use graphing uh, calculator technology to graph them. All right? and a little note that I put on here is, please note that a TI-83 calculator is accessible on the computers in class. So you know this little calculator that I bring up? You guys actually have the ability to have that one up there as well. And so I'll explain to you how you can do that uh, when you're in the class. We're also going to have some uh, graphing calculators kicking around for you guys to uh, play with. Okay? So, example three. Some kind of good news and bad news about this. Uh, you might be kind of excited to use these graphing calculators because you've seen me probably do some uh, interesting things with them. But uh, the stream that you guys have been in in mathematics has not really used these whatsoever. So this is going to be your first experience using these graphing calculators. Uh, and they unfortunately are not quite as easy as they seem. So let's try and work through these. Example three, a projectile is launched upward with a speed of 50 meters per second. Its height, h meters, after t seconds is modeled by this equation. So you would have remembered uh, on the first day of this unit, I uh, chucked a pencil at uh, someone and got them to catch it. And of course, it made a parabola. Well, so like let's say this is Johnson sitting here, and there's another student, because obviously I'm so short, and I chucked them a pencil. Well, that's going to make a parabola. All right? And you notice how the leading coefficient is negative? Well, we know that that makes an unhappy face. So that's what we're dealing with. All right? We're going to basically try and uh, see what this graph looks like. Now, the reason we're not doing it any other way is because we have some decimals, and that's what I talked about on the page before. So we're going to need to use our uh, graphing calculator. All right, so the first thing that they ask us to do is graph the quadratic function. So this isn't too tough. This is the easy part. B is going to be where it's a little bit more interesting. So you'll get your graphing calculator. All right. And so for today, it might just be you watching me do this. And uh, then when we're in class, we can have maybe a little bit of a tutorial about how we're going to uh, do this together. All right. So I uh, get my calculator out. Uh, I press the on button. I know it seems obvious, but I've got to walk you through it. Uh, one thing that you guys uh, may want to know is a couple uh, little tidbits here. If you want to reset your calculator ever, what you're going to press is second plus and then the seven button. And I'll show you what that looks like. You hit the second plus seven and then say all RAM 
like so, and it'll say RAM cleared. What that uh, does is sometimes when you pull up a calculator, some students will have left stuff on this, and so that'll just always reset it for you, which you might find kind of useful. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that equation and put it inside.